um, any questions you have or anything that we don't get answered today or or you have questions afterwards, uh, there's my email address, hickc at lincolnu.edu. Um, I'll answer any emails, uh, hopefully within 24 hours, if I don't have three or 400 to do in one day. But uh, is there anybody here today that is involved in aquaponics at this time. You want to describe your system for us first before we get started? My system isn't really much of a system. It was an experiment. I've had it for two years. Uh, the big drawback to the thing is it's indoors. I had to put it in my uh, shop in a place where there's no windows and I've got artificial light for it. So that's probably the biggest drawback. And the second thing is that uh, because of that, everything in the shop rusts. <laughs> uh, my system is basically a, uh, a table that is... Um, uh, and these are going to be round numbers, but it's probably uh, uh, 10 feet uh, in length. It's about uh, 40 inches in width. It's 12 inches deep, and it's full of pea gravel. Uh, underneath that table, I have a tank, uh, and the water flows. Well, first of all, the water uh, fills the, the table, and I've got it on a timer, and then it dumps into the tank where I've got a pump. And this pump will recirculate the water back into the fish tanks. I've got two 250-gallon totes. And uh, I believe one of them has catfish in it, and the other one has minnows in it. Uh, they all used to have minnows in them, but uh, when I put the catfish in one, why the water can flow from one to the other. Uh, uh, there's a two-inch pipe along the floor so that the first one drains into the second one and the minnows got out of there in a hurry. Uh, I, I suppose that's a rather brief description. The other thing is I'm able to keep my water at a steady temperature, and uh, I think that probably helps. So that's a brief description. So. Thank you for that, and uh, maybe if somebody is just getting started that you ought to talk to this gentleman uh, if you're interested in starting a small system. Uh, do you sell anything that you produce from it? Do you consume it yourself? What type of plants are you uh, growing in your aquaponic system? Okay, let's talk a little bit about aquaponic systems. Now, I call them integrated aquaculture systems uh, for one reason. Um, essentially, you have two biological systems, and you're actually attempting to produce two different types of biological organisms. One, of course, is you're producing fish, which are produced to enhance the plants, but these are really essentially two different biological systems, and unfortunately, they have different 
biological needs. And the two, in fact, don't completely complement each other if you approach it from a scientific basis. Now, why do I say that? Well, first of all, uh, fish are extremely efficient utilizers of feed. They're probably one of the most efficient organisms on the earth. As a result, what you get out of a fish is only a little bit of nitrate and a little bit of phosphate. Now, plant requirements are much different than that. So, some way or other, you must supplement what other, the, what other needs that the plant has. And this is why I call it integrated aquaculture. And this is just uh, a kind of a diagram depicting a system where you have the plants out here and you have the aquaculture tanks and any other component parts in here. Now, most systems that are very successful uh, have more than just water going from the aquaculture system straight to the plants. And the reason for that is a couple, but one in particular is the greatest amount of waste that comes off a of fish actually is in the form of ammonia. And ammonia is in solution in the water. Now, most plants don't like to have ammonia directly. They don't utilize ammonia directly. There are some, strawberries will, some others don't. So, in, a, in, in fact, that ammonia must be converted to a use, utilizable product. Okay, what is utilizable by a plant? Nitrate. That's why you have the fish there. So, that ammonia has to be converted to nitrate before you can utilize it in the plant system. How do we do that? Well, in a complex system, we have different types of filters. There'll be a filter first that will remove the settleable solids or the solid material in the water, and that then can be used as a supplemental it can't really be called a fertilizer because it's so low in nitrate and phosphate, but it can be used as a soil preparation. You can dry it, you can inject it, you can utilize it in many ways. So, but in order for you to convert that ammonia in the water, you've got to get those solids out of there. So you have, a, have to have a filter that removes the solids after it comes out of the fish. Okay, now we've got this water coming out of the fish and it's ammonia laden and you can't recirculate it back through the fish because ammonia is toxic to the fish. So you utilize a biofilter system where there are bacteria in there, and there's a media that these bacteria grow on, and that converts the ammonia to nitrites, and then there's another bacteria that converts it to nitrates. Then that nitrates can be circulated through the plants, and they will utilize it to grow. Now, is this a perfect marriage? A lot of people think so, but obviously it is not. Because plants need much, much more than just nitrate and phosphate. They need other micronutrients. They need metal salts, especially. The first thing you'll see if you don't supplement 
is you'll see that your plants will be getting chlorotic, be get light color. That means that they don't have maybe iron or some other metal in order to have the chlorophyll necessary to carry on efficient of photosynthesis. And if that ha doesn't happen, then your plants don't grow. Now there's basically two kinds of systems that are being operated today. This one is a substrate system and most of these systems are smaller uh, and not necessarily built on a commercial basis but utilized for home use and hobby use. Uh, why is that? Is because the effluent from the fish usually goes right into the substrate. And the substrate itself operates as the biofilter. But you're also, when you're putting that from the fish into the substrate, you're also putting in the solids material. And sooner or later, that substrate will clog. So you'll either have to remove it and change it and start over again or get rid of the solids before you put it into the substrate. And removing the solids is an expensive proposition and probably one of the most expensive pieces of equipment even in an aquaculture recirculating system where we have to remove all the solids. Now, the other type is a floating raft system. Now, these have been more, su more successful in producing large volumes of plant crops in the floating raft system. And this, these are just half-inch pieces of like that insulation you use on the outside of your house before you put the outer layer on and you drill ho little holes in it and you stick your plants right in there and you float that right on top of the water that is coming from the fish system. This is a picture of one of the most successful ones that uh, are in existence. And uh, you'll notice this is in a climate that has all around growing season, so they have a great advantage. Uh, but you'll notice that the fish system is pretty small in relation to the plant system. And normally, the ratio between fish and plants is somewhere between 1 to 10 to 1 to 15. So that means you don't have too many fish, really, in a small system to produce, produce enough nitrate in order to grow the plants. But that doesn't still supplement the micronutrients. You still have to supplement those for it to be effective. Where is this? This is uh, way down. Uh, uh, it's, pardon me? It's the Virgin Islands, correct. Dr. Rokasi is the one that, that has developed this system and uh, it's been uh, pretty successful, but in talking to him, he will admit that he also has to uh, supplement some liquid fertilizers that contain the mi necessary micronutrients in order for him to grow, to get good plant growth. This is mostly lettuce. And in a small system, one of the most important things is, is that you got to be able to sell 
that vegetable product, whatever it is, at a pretty premium price. That means that one of your greatest skills in an aquaponic system is going to be what? Marketing. Exactly. You got to be a good marketer and you got to get a premium price in order to make this thing even pay for itself, especially in a home small system. Now, if you don't care what it costs you uh, with a small system, doesn't make any difference if you want to produce enough for your own use. Now, those that are most successful raft systems, similar to this one, produce high-end herbs. And they put them in little fancy packets and they sell them for a buck a piece. And they probably weigh an ounce or two ounces or something else. Well, that's a high profit margin and those places are able to keep operating. Now again, this is a raft system and this is a large one indoors and the fish systems sit in another uh, building. Now why would you have the fish system in another building? First of all, you really don't want the fish system in under the same kind of conditions that you have the plants. First of all, you don't need a lot of light to grow fish. Also, light is a disadvantage to growing fish because it produces algae. As soon as, and algae gums up everything. You'd have to control the algae in your fish system because It'll plug up all your valves and everything else in time if it ha is exposed to strong sunlight. So you essentially want to have this fish system separate. Here's a combined system, and a lot of these systems are in existence. Uh, if you ever want to see two outstanding operations, uh, they're in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Growing Power, and then there's one called Green Acres. And uh, in this one in particular, uh, this is a community project and it's a nonprofit. Uh, but they produce a lot of food that's sold within the community and it's an excellent community project. And there's one thing that's really important then to understand in these systems, all the labor is free. Now, if you want to pay for your labor, that's a whole different thing if you want to make some money while you're working at it. So you have to be a little careful on how you do this and uh, you have to approach it as a business. Again, um, this is a combined system where the plants are on the top and then the fish are in the bottom tank. Why are they on the bottom? Keep them away from the light so you don't have a lot of algae growth. Now you can see these systems are mainly built out of wood and they're just lined with plastic. Uh, that's actually the best way to do it it is to utilize your own talents in building your system. And I can guarantee you there are all types of salespeople out there that will tell you that they have the best system for aquaponics and you ought to buy this. But I guarantee you if you look into the information enough and decide what your system should be like and then build it yourself, that it'll be better and it'll produce more of what you want than what somebody else. There's a lot of snake oil. When it comes to aquaponics, there are many, many, many snake oil salesmen out there, and you got to be really careful because they have products they like to sell. This, again, is two different types of systems. This, again, is... 
a system that utilizes the media to put the plants in. This one is just a tube system where the water runs through. And this is similar to the floating raft system, only they're utilizing PVC piping to put the plants in. Both systems work on a small basis. Um, now years ago, and this must have been 10 years ago, I visited a system up near Peoria, Illinois, and it was being operated by ADM, and everybody knows ADM. Uh, they had 13 acres of greenhouses, and then they have lar they had large uh, fish tanks with uh, tilapia in them. And not only did they have that, but it was right beside a uh, biochemical plant that was producing some type of a, a diesel fuel. As a result, they had waste heat. So they piped all that waste heat into their 13 acres of uh, uh, greenhouses so that they could operate year round. The first thing they found out that it wasn't economically efficient to have the fish, so they got rid of the fish. And the second thing they found out, they were producing 33,000 heads of lettuce a day. And they couldn't make any money in it. So all I'm saying is that it is extremely difficult with an aquaponic system to make to make it a business and to make money with, but it can be a very good hobby system. And if you are a good enough marketer and produce a product that's in demand, you can produce some income for yourself. And again, I'm not saying that you can pay for all your labor. Depends upon what your, you think your labor is worth. And uh, so it's, it's, it's somewhat difficult to make money, but they make really good hobby systems. They also make good hob uh, systems for schools because uh, you have two different biological organisms that can be utilized in science experiments and the animals themselves can be utilized in, in biology classes. So within a school system, they're pretty good also. The only problem with in the school system is we run up this against the same thing. They want to get started but then in the summer, everybody wants to leave. Well, what do they do with the live fish and the plants and everything when everybody wants to go? They have to be taken care of daily. And just like any other live system where you're working with live animals, you have to make sure that your pumps are running. If the electricity goes off, you've got to have something. You've got to have a generator. And, you, and it's got to be there that you can start immediately so that you're circulating water through the fish. So in order to have a system that's a commercial basis, that means you've got to have backup. That means you need a, a backup generator. Now, if you don't want to put that alarm under your bed, which you almost have to do if you're going to get the generator started fast enough to get the pumps going, keep your fish alive, then you gotta have an automatic switching system for your generator. And those are extremely expensive. Now within our recirculating systems at Lincoln University where we do most of our research, we have to have backup generators which are on automatic systems. And uh, we run them once a week just to make sure that they come on and everything works. And you have to do that with backup systems. Anytime you got live animals, it's not like having a cow stand out there and she hanging her head today and you call the vet and they come and take a blood sample and then you take care of the cow and, and 
improve her health. Changes in the fish system can occur just almost in minutes. And you got to be able to make some type of adjustment when that happens. Now again, this is just a diagrammatic design of a double tiered system. And these systems work pretty well. And you see the plants are on the top. Of course, the second one, you'd have to use artificial light in it. And then these are mainly built w of wood and they use heavy PVC liners inside to hold the water. And these are the less, least expensive way to do. Um, although that you can, you can purchase uh, inexpensive tanks at most farm stores that'll work for your fish systems and the PVC piping can be purchased there also. So the components are all on the shelf. You don't have to buy a unit in order to do this. And this is just the basics of a, ho of a hobby system where you have the plants on the top and the fish in the bottom and the fish waste is going in there. And I'm saying if you're gonna have a big system though, you're gonna have to have a biofilter and a filter to get rid of the solid waste also. But in a hobby system, in five years if you want to, you can change the media even though it gets all clogged up. If it's just pea gravel, well, you change it in five years or whatever it takes for it to get clogged up. And then it'll also work again as the biofilter. Now, again, this is another hobby system. And uh, this works quite well for, it. that's just uh, a big tank cut in half and on the bottom the fish and you have a small pump and it runs up to the top and the vegetables are on the top. Any questions so far? On anything? Yes, sir. Do you have a system? Do you operate a system and if so, what kind? Pardon me? Do you personally have a system in operation currently? Uh, we have hydroponic systems uh, and we supplement them from our separate aquaculture systems, but we don't have a system which is completely tied together. They're in different buildings and there are pipes that run the affluent through. But again, this all goes through a filter system first before it goes in to the hydroponic system. I'm going to show you sources of information where you can get basic design criteria and so that you, you can build whatever system you would like to. Now, the Southern Regional Aquaculture Center, uh, put, all you got to do is put SRAC in your computer and search. And when you get that site, you go to publications and then guide sheets. And they have enough, this is all free information. And I really like it because it's all based on science. There's no hype or anything else. Nobody's trying to sell anything. But everything that they've done here, they have actually tried and it's proven to be workable on a regular basis and it doesn't take any great great scientist to do it. And the other one is ATRA, uh, which is a National Sustainable Agriculture Information System. It has many publications and a great discussion on uh, aquaponics and I think you can just enter A-T-T-R-A and come up with that. 
and it'll have specific designs or specific designs for small school systems, small home systems, commercial systems, or any type that you want. And it discusses the difference between the uh, floating raft systems and uh, the media type of systems. Now, again, I want to emphasize that uh, fish are really only incidental to growing plants in water. And uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, the ratio of space is about 1 to 15. That means you got to have a lot of plant space to take care of the nutrients that you're going to have available. Uh, I had a person call me the other day and they say, uh, this is working out pretty well, but boy, my plants are getting yellow already. And uh, I said, well, you can either do this. You can put a rusty nail in there, which may help, or some metals, or you can get a liquid supplement that is balanced. You can get a small bottle from the from your local farm store or from a nursery and it will be very inexpensive and you can drip in a little bit every week or something like that and it'll provide the micronutrients that plants need to grow. Yes, sir. Pardon me? Well, uh, at this time, there is not a fish feed that is certified. So, uh, it's difficult to say that you want to be certified organic if the fish can't be. And uh, until they come up with the how to have a certifiable fish. Now, the biggest contention is that the reason that fish can't be certified organic is because one of the components in fish feed is fish meal and fish oil. Well, uh, fish, me fish meal is considered a non-sustainable product because it's actually obtained from harvesting menhaden, anchovies, and those types of fish in the ocean, which there are finite populations. However, if you only harvest at what they determine as sustainable levels, because they do reproduce, and the oceans do produce a lot, um, aquaculture in itself uses less than 10% of the fish meal. And as the fish meal as a commodity is a tremendous commodity over the world. Now, why is fish meal like that? Well, for instance, it's used a lot in a lot of dairy feeds because cows produce more milk. But do you, even on organic milk, do you see on that bottle or on that container, this contains fish meal? No, but they still certify it, but they won't certify fish. So it's an advocate thing rather than a scientific aspect. And this is where the difficulty lies in getting organic certification for certain things. Yes, sir. You want to talk to the mic? One of the things I had seen in uh, doing just a little bit of research on this was um, like growing duckweed, I guess, as a, a feed for the tilapia. I mean, obviously, you'd have to have, you know, a pond or something. Have you seen any systems that produce their own feed for the? Um, growing duckweed is pretty easy. Uh, <laughs> most ponds grow it, even though most people don't want it. Okay, why does a pond have duckweed on it? It's got too high of a nutrient level. Okay, too much nitrogen going into it. Yeah, you can harvest duckweed and feed it to tilapia. But here, let me go on here. 
Let's talk a little bit about financial aspects, and then we'll get back to duckweed. Um, there is no aquaponic modeling where you actually can take a model and then you can scale it to your size that will be successful and can produce a profit. Why not? Well, there's a lack of aquaponic data which meet the scientific standards required to actually develop the models. Uh, there's an awful lot of information on hearsay on aquaponics, but there's very little scientific information on aquaponics. An awful lot of success depends on your skill level. And this greatly differs greatly between individuals. What is your skill level in keeping those fish alive? Fish are difficult to keep alive. Even tilapia, which is the most commonly raised fish because they're pretty for forgiving. Actually, I'd rather grow a carp because they grow faster in tilapia and I don't have to heat the water. Commercial viability. Don't believe everything you hear. Build your own experience, and then you determine what is the commercial viability, because, as I say, there's snake oil salesmen out there, and they'll tell you you can make piles of money, but it's very difficult. Um, anybody that wants to start out, start out like this man, start out small. Utilize your information and your experiences to advance your skill and your system. Now if you make money at it, good. Then you can take that money and you can invest it back in and make it larger. And that's not only the most successful way that people run aquaponic systems, that's the most successful way people run any aquaculture systems, complex aquaculture systems. They start out small, they build on their experiences, and then as they make money, they invest it back in and grow. All the people that you see that are successful in aquaculture, and there are many people that have made a lot of money in aquaculture, but it's been a very difficult, and it takes a lot of learning in order to do it. And they spent many years in doing it, but they started out small. And they learned a lot when they had small systems. Systems which include degassers, and when I mean degassers, uh, fish give off carbon dioxide, and sometimes you have to get rid of the, de the carbon dioxide and add oxygen if there isn't enough in the water, otherwise the fish won't survive. And biofilters are the most effective to operate. And if you're not growing tilapia, these two systems will have to be included in your system because the water quality has to be a uh, good enough value that those fish can survive in it. Only tilapia will survive in water that is less quality. And I've seen, I've seen people kill tilapia also because the water quality wasn't good enough. So it's not a panacea to, to the fish. No. Tilapia is probably the most successful species in the U.S. aquaponics industry. Now, if you uh, query aquaponics in 
on the internet. You can find a lot of information. They're doing a lot of work in Australia. Uh, down there, they're raising cobia, a high-end species, demands high prices. Uh, when they do these types of species, though, they require very high water quality. And they're complex recirculating systems, and they're just shunning off some of the water for the plant systems that is uh, the ammonia is already converted to nitrates. Any system, now tilapia in Missouri is not an approved species. It's not on the approved species list. And the, uh, that list can be accessed on the Missouri Department of Conservation site. You can raise tilapia in Missouri with a special permit from the director of the conservation department. Now, what are some of the requirements? First of all, any system with tilapia must drain into an approved waste treatment system. And that must be a, approved by DNR. What is an approved waste system? Well, I've seen them confiscate tilapia from a fish producer where the effluent from the system. Now, if you got water, you're going to have some effluent. It's got to go somewhere. So their effluent went through a two-pond system, had no access to go anywhere else, and they confiscated 60,000 tilapia because that's not an approved system. That means if your effluent goes into a city treatment plant, yes, you probably can get a permit to operate it and utilize tilapia as a species. If it goes into a septic system, that depends on the DNR, whether they approve it as an approved system. So you want to be careful and you have to get this permit. The best thing to do is to contact your local conservation agent in that county and have him be involved in the development of your program and the development of your system. And he'll be aware of it then. And then they'll send out a biologist who will inspect it and see if it meets their criteria. If it does, it'll go to the director and he'll send it to the uh, regulations committee and the regulations committee will decide whether you should have a permit or not. Otherwise, it's not legal for rearing in Missouri. Okay, any questions? You want to talk? <laughs> Do we need to have a um, license even for just a hobby, aquaponics? Anytime you have tilapia and you're rearing them, you need a permit. Yes. There are non-native species, and uh, they're concerned with uh, utilizing Tilapia is just like what happened with uh, Chinese carp in the big rivers. They essentially got a better hold in the system than the native species. And they have supplanted the native species habitat in the big rivers. Silver carp, big head carp, grass carp, they're all those. Yes, sir. My question was, why did ADM get rid of the fish? Pardon me? You, you said the ADM had an aquaponic system and they got rid of the fish. They confiscated it, yeah. That's what, okay, they confiscated the fish. Okay, I, I missed that part. Yeah. My other question was, I heard a little bit about using composting worms in the media-based beds. Do you have any comments or knowledge on that? Using. Um, I've seen systems where they utilize that 
Uh, well, let me tell you, you're managing biological systems. And each one of these systems has to have a certain balance. And if you got them tied together, those balances have to meet the requirements of the other biological system. And every time you add something, it just gets more difficult. It gets more difficult and balanced. When you have uh, worm systems, then, and you utilize water, or if you return water or anything else like that, then you have pH problems, depending upon the soil type, depending upon how much, if it's a, a, a if it originates from limestone uh, areas where there's high calcium carbonate, which is good for fish. Uh, otherwise, you'll have a low pH problem, and the fish really won't do well in that low pH. So you got to you got to match these systems, and every time you add one, it just gets more difficult. Yes, sir. You keep mentioning a one to fifteen ratio. How are you measuring the fish and the plants? I'm just I'm essentially measuring surface area of water and you base uh, your density of fish on the surface area of water like maybe uh, a quarter of a pound per gallon something like that and and then you use your multiplier that way yes sir Two questions. Uh, somebody mentioned duckweed earlier, but are there other on-farm sources of fish feed that you could use so you wouldn't have to purchase the feed? And the second question is, um, maybe answer that and I'll ask the second. Uh, the first question was uh, utilizing duckweed as a feed. Uh, tilapia will do well on duckweed and algae, but you still have to supplement it with some fish food because it doesn't contain everything they need either. Now remember, one, one reason they have fish feeds is because they are, ba uh, they are balanced uh, amino acid complexes. No matter what the feed stuff is that they utilize for the uh, major protein source, there is a balance of certain amino acids that are required by that fish. So the fish feed is, is ingredients are put in there with that in mind. So you would have to supplement it, but you can utilize it. They will do pretty well on even algae in the water, suspended algae in the water, but they wouldn't grow as fast as if you were feeding them a balanced feed. I've experimented a little bit with um, systems using sort of backyard swimming pools, three, four, five thousand gallons, stocked with catfish, and just taking the water out and using that water for um, for watering my plants, and then just supplementing with fresh water as the water level goes down. So, and not using. Could you comment on any of the? Has there been other research done on those kinds of systems? Yes, uh, there's. There are systems where. These people are primarily in the aquaculture business. There's a large trout system in Wisconsin where they, and of course where you, use, where you grow trout, they don't really recirculate the water, they just run it through once, and, and then it becomes effluent, so they have a large effluent to take care of it. Well, they use it for irrigating their wheat field. Now, some of that water is returned, but it's not returned to the fish system. They use it for other irrigation. So that works out well, and it does help. It adds nitrogen and phosphate to that field that it wouldn't have otherwise. And at the same time, you're getting rid of it because you can't have it as a discharge because you probably wouldn't be allowed to discharge it into a stream. So you're getting rid of the nutrients, and that works. Other on-farm sources of fish food? Uh, things that you could grow? On-farm sources? 
Uh, well, the ingredients in fish feed, some of them are difficult to get on an individual basis, especially even with tilapia feed, there's usually some fish meal, and that's a commodity that unless you buy tons and tons, the price is going to be so high. And the other thing is most of the fish feeds today, uh, especially the tilapia feeds, catfish feeds, utilize soybean meal as the primary protein source. Well, there are, in soybean meal, there are anti materials in there that won't allow fish to digest it. In order to get rid of that, you got to heat it to a high temperature. And this is why they utilize the type of systems they do to produce the pellets. And it has a high temperature and it gets rid of those anti anti items in the feed that affect the fish. And when the feed comes out, then it is suitable for the fish. And uh, these types of uh, pieces of equipment, again, are very expensive. Even to have a tabletop one to build experimental feed is expensive. And it's cheap, actually cheaper to go to MFA and buy a bag of low-protein feed. If you're feeding tilapia, you can feed a uh, fish feed that's 32 to 36% protein. That's a low protein feed. If you feed trout, it's 45 to 55. Some of the starter feeds are 65% uh, protein, and most of the protein in that type of a feed is from fish meal, which is about $1,900 a ton. But even the ingredients uh, in other fish feeds like soybeans have uh, gone up higher and, and fish feed prices have increased also. But the fish again are incidental to a small system. Uh, the rule of thumb, if you can sell enough fish to pay for the operational costs of your plant system, you got it made. And if you have a plant that you can market at a high enough price, you can make some money. So that's a way that you ought to approach it if you want to do it on a little bit bigger basis than a hobby basis. Oh. Anything else? I appreciate your time. Uh, Anybody wants anything further, or I can direct you to more detailed information, just email me. I'll see what I can do. Thank you.